Latino Business Council of Silicon Valley, Small Business Majority, Silicon Valley Black Chamber of Commerce, Silicon Valley Organization, Small Business Development Center, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, Silicon Valley, Winchester Business Association, San Jose Public Library Works, SCORE Silicon Valley, eBay, and Start Small Think Big. Today's agenda will focus on covering a few housekeeping items. We'll introduce this afternoon's speakers. We'll address the process for addressing questions and we'll conclude the session with a list of resources and information for next week's webinar. We would like to ask all participants to be placed on mute at this very moment for the entirety of the presentation. And all will be invited to speak, ask questions during the Q&A session, which will immediately take place after the presentation. Please use the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen to scribe questions that pertain to today's presentation topic. If you have any questions pertaining to other COVID-19 topics, please email or visit our website for resources at www.sjeconomy.com backslash COVID-19 business info. Someone from our team will assist you. Vietnamese and Spanish speaking staff are reading these emails. Feel free to ask questions in these particular language if it is more comfortable for you. The speaker will answer selected questions in English, after which the answer will be repeated in the language in which it was asked. In the event you need to leave during the webinar, while it's in session, please email your question and someone from our staff will get back to you. Our email address is located here and at the very end of this PowerPoint. Today's presenters will address questions that pertain to their presentation. Today we have two speakers for you. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Gray Torico, Program Manager with Start Small Think Big. Our second speaker is Elena Morena Gutierrez, Associate with Fenwick and West LLP. Thanks, Sandra. This is Gray. I am with Start Small Think Big, getting the presentation ready for all of you. So to begin, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming and for sharing space with us as we get started on uh, reviewing the financial relief that exists for small business owners um, currently impacted by COVID-19. I do wanna thank Fenwick, um, which is the firm from which Elena is from, uh, who has done, um, they have done a tremendous job in supporting us through this process. Um, I also want to give special thanks to Cleary Gottlieb for the research and the material that they've provided in support of this presentation on both federal and private programs. So just a couple of things related to um, what you're going to be seeing in our presentation today. Uh, please know that all of this information should not be misconstrued as legal or tax advice. And we will be most likely sharing this information at a, at a later time. And so stay tuned as Sandra um, gives us that information at the end. But please just note um, these um, particular disclaimers as relates to this presentation. So this is just a little bit of what we're going to be reviewing. And I'm gonna, again, um, let Elena speak about that in a moment. So here is just a little bit about what we do at Start Small, Think Big. We do provide legal, financial, and marketing assistance, and we are definitely uh, willing and able to do that for San Jose-specific clients. 
Uh, again, I'm the San Jose program manager, so many of the intakes are going to be coming to me. And if there are any questions related to how we can support you, please don't hesitate to let me know um, after the fact. We do provide uh, high quality uh, services for small business owners. And so in this current time, um, I wanted to share a little bit about the eligibility criteria as it relates to um, who we're serving. Um, these are the two stages of business owners that we're looking at, particularly um, business owners who are currently selling goods or services um, in the last three months that are equal to or greater than $500 or have a legal need that is keeping them from selling um, their goods, uh, as well as businesses up to a million dollars in annual revenue. And then the second point here is just for folks who ha have um, household income that is not exceeding 70 750% of the federal poverty guidelines. And again, um, looking at businesses that are not making more than a million dollar in revenue. Um, these are the criteria currently. And so if you do think you qualify, in a minute I'll share where you can go to apply for our uh, immediate assistance currently. So just a little note related to what we're doing for this particular moment that we're in a very unprecedented times and so, we're looking to support as much as we can. Uh, we are gonna talk a little bit again with Elena's help related to um, the financial piece as well as any other uh, legal considerations she wants to, to let us know about. But in particular, we are definitely looking to address as an organization how we can support business owners. I wanna to point to particularly for number two, um, addressing legal concerns. Uh, one thing that we are unique in is that we do activate top tier law firms um, that are able and willing to support pro bono currently at this time, um, anybody who has legal or loan grant assistance questions. And um, you can definitely let us know if there's anything that we can do. And as it pertains to one and two, or one and three, you can definitely let us know as well how we can help. And so again, these are some of the quick links that I wanted to flag. Um, I'm happy to share this um, after the presentation is over if there's any questions related to this. Um, but just for you to know, uh, as it relates to our ongoing resources, public facing events, webinars like these are taking place periodically and very frequently at this point with various uh, organizations. Um, and so again, something for you to keep in mind as you continue figuring out what you can do to continue uh, moving through this this moment that we're in so again um, in conclusion and in summary um, here are the ways that you can engage with us most immediately if you believe that you do qualify for our services and want to again get the full tier assistance that we provide financial legal and marketing you can visit our um, our link there um, it's, a, it's a shortened link for you to, to easily access you will get the um, access immediately to our application. If you're looking to get COVID-19 pro bono assistance, meaning that right now you have an urgent matter that needs to be attended to, um, and you, again, uh, uh, time is of the essence, uh, that is the link that you can go to that you can actually access our, our information and then we can start plugging you into the process. And lastly, information as it relates to webinars that are coming, we are updating this regularly, so please do stay tuned to our website and finally my information there for you all to have for the future. So without further ado, I want to give this over to Elena, who will now share a little bit about herself and then start the process. Hi hey everyone, uh, my name is Elena Moreno Cloutier. I'm an associate at Fenwick and West. Um, I work in the startup practice, so um, I provide general corporate uh, counsel to startup clients. And we have had a lot of clients that have been applying for the payment protection program loans in particular. Um, so this is something that, you know, I've been seeing a lot of in, in my practice and, and that's why I'm you know, here to talk about it today. I think next slide. Yeah, so these are some tips. I think these are from Start Small, Think Big for you guys just to keep in mind um, during these times. It's important to preserve as much cash as possible um, to you know, give yourself the most amount of flexibility going forward. Um, and then also to keep in mind that what's going on now, just generally, um, you should always have in mind that this might allow certain expenses to be renegotiated. 
um, for example, loan payments, uh, please speak to your lenders about that. Um, rent, please speak to your landlord and please speak to your insurance and utility providers um, to see if, you know, if, if you're having trouble paying those expenses, um, you can definitely, you know, try negotiating with them because I think that that will, you know, that could potentially lead to something helpful for you. Um, and then um, just to reassess all discretionary expenses and investments, um, any sort of inventory or equipment that you don't need at the moment or anything that's sort of extra, of course, yeah, think about ways that you can cut down there. Next slide. Yeah, so in terms of thinking about how much loan or relief you need, um, you'll wanna think about how many sales you need to cover your fixed expenses. Um, and then sort of, you know, be es then be estimating, you know, based on COVID-19, um, how, how that's gonna impact what your sales are gonna look like going forward. Um, and then if your sales are not covering your fixed expenses, what is your cash outflow? Um, you should estimate this per day, week, and month, and think about which expenses can be controlled um, or delayed. And then you also just wanna be thinking about, you know, we, we don't know quite how long um, this COVID-19 is gonna be impacting businesses. And so you'll wanna think about cash shortfall over the next few months. Um, be looking at uh, cash outflow per month times the number of months that, you know, you could estimate that this might be going on. And this will provide you an estimate of the working capital and financial relief that you'll be needing. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna go over um, financial relief programs available at the federal level, at the California state level, and then um, from private organizations. Um, next slide. So just as a note, uh, the information here is obviously current as of today, um, and it's definitely not comprehensive. Um, you should not use this as a substitute for um, legal or professional advice. And definitely, if you have you know, the ability to consult other professional advisors, um, please do um, regarding your individual circumstances. And then as um, Sandra and Gray said earlier, um, there's gonna be an opportunity at the end to ask questions. So we can also um, potentially help you with some more specific questions that you might have. Um, just to note that viewing this webinar doesn't create any kind of attorney-client relationship with Fenwick and West. And um, we're gonna provide information on various financial relief programs for small businesses, but you should not construe this presentation as an endorsement of any specific program. We just tried to get together as many resources um, as we could just to you know, present them to you and so that you know about, you know, they're available, um, but we don't necessarily have endorsements over specific ones. Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, as I said before, I'm gonna go over um, the different financial relief programs available at the federal level. So at the federal level, this is, the big one is the Paycheck Protection Program. And there's also other grants and loans available under, um, or from the Small Business Administration, um, which is what administers the Payment Protection Program, and then a few other things available um, under the CARES Act, which was passed, I think, on April 3rd. Um, that's the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act. Then uh, at the state level, there's a few things that, at the state level. It's not quite as um, robust as, as what's being provided at the federal level, but um, there is a fund to help with um, so there is, a, there is a fund to help um, guarantee loans, uh, and then there's also certain tax relief available for small businesses. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about some other programs that are available from um, private organizations like Facebook, GoFundMe, FundRocket, and others. And then there's gonna be um, some additional resources at the end for approaching loans and grants available um, for those impacted by COVID-19. All right, next slide. Uh, next slide. Okay, so the payment protection program. Um, this is the big one. And the reason that um, this is such a popular program is because this is a forgivable loan. So if you use it uh, correctly um, to, to, to cover the correct expenses, um, as when, of course, I'm going to talk about that later, it can be completely forgiven. So it's a really attractive option, um, especially because the other things I'm going to talk about here, I think for the most part, 
are loans, not grants. Um, there's a few small dollar value grants that I'll talk about um, available from private organizations at the end. But um, this is really the, the big one. Um, and as you may have heard, originally the, the original amount allocated for the payment protection program was $349 billion. They opened up applications for the first round on April 3rd and the funds were all allocated within two weeks. So it's obviously an incredibly popular program. Um, and the Paycheck Protection Program is expected to get an infusion of $320 billion in funding as early as this week. Um, I think um, that bill has already passed maybe in the Senate um, and we're, we're waiting for the House to, um, to approve it as well. But that's the amount that they are looking to allocate um, additionally to this program. Um, so because this was so popular, um, you know, for obvious reasons the first time around, I would really recommend that you take the time now before it even opens to get all your ducks in a row so that you can apply as soon as the applications open up again, um, since we would expect the funds to run out quickly again. So the idea behind the pay check protection program is to keep employees on the payroll. Um, this, this can mean, I mean, it depending on what your business is, that you, they're on the payroll and not working, or they're on the payroll and doing maybe some other things that they can do from home, um, or if they can work completely from home, then um, you know, working as usual. It's sort of up to you um, how, you know, sort of what you expect from your employees if you're paying them through this Paycheck Pro Protection Program loan. Um, but yet yeah, the, the idea is to keep folks on the payroll so that they don't need to collect unemployment, and then to make it easier for you guys to ramp up operations when you can fully open back up. All the loan terms under the Payment Protection Program are the same for everyone. So what's listed here, um, you know, besides the amount, the interest rate, term, um, repayment, loan forgiveness, all of that applies. It's the same for everybody um, across the board. So, um, you know, the first thing about this, this um, program is that you have to certify that under the, cur the current economic uncertainty related to COVID-19 makes this loan request uh, necessary to support the ongoing operation of your business. So, you know, for example, and I, I you know, I don't know sort of what circumstances the folks on this presentation are in, but um, we had some clients that just thought, oh, well, this is, you know, great. This is potentially money that we can, we can add to our business. Um, and that's not, you, that's not a good reason to apply for the loan. Um, I mean, you might have heard about, I think it was Shake Shack that got about $10 million in Paycheck Protection Program loans, and they ended up returning it because it sort of became clear that they don't actually need the, the money. It was just sort of like, oh, great, this money is available. Let's apply for it. So it really does need to be going to businesses that are severely impacted by COVID-19, which I, is a lot of businesses these days. Um, ones that, you know, the sales are impacted by... COVID-19 or ones that, you know, require a physical presence to operate and, and that's not possible right now, um, things like that. So, you know, before you even think about applying, just, you know, make sure that you can certify that this is, this is money that you really need to keep your business afloat because um, that's sort of like the, the cornerstone of the program and um, I, I think they're going to be taking that seriously. Um, but assuming that that applies to you, um, I will continue to talk about um, the loans. So um, the interest rate is 1% annually and the repayment is deferred for a minimum of six months. Uh, interest will still accrue during the first six months, but like if, if say if you receive, yeah, if you receive the loan May 1st, then you won't need to start paying until um, November 1st. <laughs> I'm terrible at math. Um, and but it's also important to keep in mind that if you um, follow the guidelines for the um, forgiveness, then you won't even um, need to be repaying the loan. So the term of the loan is, is two years and then loan forgiveness. So um, you can receive forgiveness equal to eight weeks of payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent obligations and utilities. Um, and borrowers that have reduced their workforce, reduced salaries by more than 25% will have their eligibility for forgiveness reduced proportionally. So um, what does this mean? Oh, I, going back, I, I realized I missed one, which is that the, the principal amount, the amount that you're gonna be eligible for is the lesser of $10 million 
or two times the average monthly payroll costs over the prior 12 month period. So I think they give you an option of what particular 12 month period you can use. It can either be the preceding 12 months. It can be, I think, last calendar year. Um, I'll, can, I'll confirm on that detail and, and circulate that around because I know that you have a, a little bit of an option in terms of what period you use to determine the average monthly payroll costs. Um, one thing to note is that if you do have anybody that's paid over $100,000 um, in annual salary, it's capped at $100,000. Um, so just to note in, in terms of when you're determining that 2.5 times the average monthly payroll costs, uh, just want to make that note. Um, and then, like I said, I will circulate a little bit more guidance about what 12 month period you use to calculate that two, two and a half times average monthly payroll. Um, so you're, you're eligible to receive two and a half times the average monthly payroll, like I said, which is 10 weeks. And then the amount of forgiveness, you look at an eight week period, um, which means that they, if, if you're using the money to pay payroll, then you will have some left over for other items. And the um, eligible items that you can use that, that extra money for are mortgage interest, rent obligations, and utilities. Um, it's important to keep in mind that no more than 25% of the forgiven amount can be for non-payroll costs. But I think, you know, if you, if you think about the math there, it, that should be sort of how it works out. So um, I'm going to talk now about loan forgiveness. Um, so all of the loan can be forgiven if it's used for the proper purposes, um, which are, like I said before, payroll costs, um, and annualized per employee, covered mortgage, in covered mortgage interest, covered rent, and covered utilities. Um, where at least 75% of the amount is used for payroll. Um, however, the amount of forgiveness can be reduced if you reduce the number of employees or decrease salaries for employees making less than $100,000 by 25% or more. So um, to think about this forgiveness reduction um, related to headcount, what you're gonna compare is the average full-time employees per month during the eight-week period following the loan. So say you received the loan on May 1st, then you'd be looking at um, the eight-week period, so May and June, basically, um, looking at the, the um, average number of full-time employees that you have during that period. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that you're comparing against is your choice of either um, the average number of full-time employees per month from the period of February 15th, 2019 to June 30th, 2019, or for the period of um, January 1st, 2020 to February 29th, 2020. So whichever one is, is I guess, better for you, whichever one has less full-time employees is the one that you're going to want to use. Um, and then you multiply the loan amount by the resulting ratio of, of that first number, so the eight weeks following the loan agreement, um, over the number of full-time employees that you had in the past to calculate the amount of the loan that's forgiven. So as a simple example, assume that you get $100,000 of the loan and you have eight full-time employees in the eight-week period following the loan. Um, if you have 12 employees um, from February 15th, 2019 to June 30th, 2019 on average, and 10 employees during the period of January 1st, 2020 to um, February 29th, 2020, what you would do is calculate the ratio um, of 8 to 10 because you can choose the lower number of the two comparison periods. And so you would be eligible for only $80,000 of forgiveness. Um, and... It's important, though, to note that forgiveness is not reduced to the extent that employees are terminated in. So if you've, if you've had to terminate employees over the past um, several weeks, um, but then you increase the number of employees again before June 30th, um, that, that still counts. Um, and you don't need to rehire the same people. It's just they're going to be looking at the average number of full-time employees. So, um, you know, continuing the example from before, if you have eight employees in the eight week post loan period, because you terminated two people, um, you know, say in the past couple weeks, but then you hire two more people before June 30th, then you can get 100% of the loan forgiven. Um, and then there's similar reductions for, for salary reductions. Um, so, you know, if, if you decrease the, you know, employee salaries by more than 25%, then there's going to be a corresponding decrease to the amount of loan that can be forgiven. Um, so you can see that this is really structured to keep payroll in place. Um, 
And if you have, I know that's a little bit complicated. If you have questions about that, I can do my best to answer them at the end. Um, I think we're all a little bit still figuring out exactly how it will work um, I, since this has been rolled out so quickly, but that's sort of the general idea is that you wanna look at the number of full-time employees that you have after the loan and then at a period before the loan. And if the number after the loan is lower than before the loan, then there's gonna be some reduction um, in the amount that can be forgiven. All right, so um, then use of proceeds. Um, Cis capital expenditures here, I don't know that that's actually the case. I think really you have to think of it as being payroll. That's the main way that you can use the, the money from the PPP loan. And then you can also use it for mortgage, rent, and utilities. I actually don't think it can be used on, for interest on existing debt, to be honest. I think it's really just those, those four things. So again, payroll, ignoring what it says on the slide, payroll, mortgage, utilities, and um, rent. You need to be very careful to keep clear records of any loan money that you receive to show that it's only used for these things. Because if there's any sort of ambiguity that you're using it for other things, like I guess to pay, pay debts or to um, you know, purchase supplies, that sort of thing, um, the loan is not forgivable. Even if you are able to retain employ employees, it just, it needs to be clear sort of that the money that you receive from the loan is used only for the specific things that the loan can cover. Um, so I know we've had some clients that have opened up like, like a separate account um, just for the PPP funds and then used that directly for payroll just to make it super clear that the loans weren't being misused in any way. Um, so you can, that's something to talk about with the lender and I'll talk about lenders in a second. Um, just to, to think about ways that you can make it very clear that you're using the loan in the correct way. Let's see. Um, and then other terms, loans are uncollateralized. So um, you don't have to put up any collateral from your business to guarantee them. They don't require a personal guarantee from, from business owners. And they're non-recourse um, to, to your shareholders and your members and your partners. And then also um, the forgiven loan amounts are not taxable. So it's a, it's a, it's a very um, lenient loan in, in that respect. Um, the goal really is to, to be able to keep folks on, on payroll. And then also, um, if you intend to use the employee retention tax credit, which you may have heard about, um, you can't take the PPP loan at all. So that's something to keep in mind. And then we have uh, some additional information here at the bottom. I'm gonna send around a, um, a list of links because I've found some other good ones since putting together these slides um, so that you guys will all have them. So don't, don't worry about like writing this down right now. But there's a lot of good stuff available at the um, SBA website and then at the, um, at the Treasury website as well. Um, but uh, like I said, I'll send those around. Uh, next slide. Okay, so then this slide deals with the eligibility for the program. Um, in order to be eligible, you must have been operational on or before February 15th, 2020. Um, one thing to note that the SBA has clarified um, is that if you are a seasonal um, business, and so maybe you weren't technically in operation on February 15th or your operations were minimal, um, the lender can actually consider um, whether a seasonal borrower was in operation on February 15th, 2020, or alternatively for an eight week period between February 15th, 2019 and June 30th, 2019. So if you operate in summer months, um, just something to keep in mind that doesn't, um, you don't need to worry too much about that February 15th date. But yeah, the idea is that it's supposed to apply to businesses that were operational sort of before COVID started. Um, you need to have paid salaries and payroll taxes for employees or independent contractors. Like I said before, you must be able to show that you have been substantially impacted um, by the public health restrictions related to COVID-19 and make a good faith certification to this effect. Um, the size of your business, um, there's been I, I, some, some news about this is also sort of related to the Shake Shack thing that I brought up earlier. Um, generally the loan is available for businesses that are less than 500 employees only. 
as well as independent contractors and sole proprietors, and I should say nonprofits. So really, I mean, it's open to, to all types of businesses. Um, really where it starts becoming limited is, is the size of the business. Um, however, there is, there is um, that less than 500 employees rule um, is waived for a few things. Um, there's more information about that on the SBA site. And if you have questions about that, um, I can do my best to answer them. But for the most part, rule of thumb is that uh, less than 500 employees. And yeah, as I said before, this includes nonprofits, veterans organizations, tribal business concerns, sole proprietorships, self-employed individuals, independent contractors. Um, everybody is available to apply for this program. So under, and then there's this no credit elsewhere requirement waived. So what that means is that under other SBA loans, um, typically you'll need to show that you've tried to apply for credit elsewhere. So have some sort of record of being denied, um, denied a loan from another, another lender before you go to the SBA. They just wanted to make that clear that that's waived here. So you don't have to worry about that. You can just go, you can go first to, um, to apply for the PPP program. Uh, important to keep in mind that you can only receive one PPP loan. Um, you can apply for both PPP loans and other SBA financial assist assistance, which I'll talk about in a minute, as long as uh, you don't use the PPP loan for the same purpose as the other SBA loans. So again, that's really just, again, that same idea of you wanna keep it clear which money you receive from the PPP loan and what you're using it for. And so like if you're using the PPP loan to cover payroll, which you'll be doing, um, you can't use another SBA loan for the same cost in that period. But you could use the other loan for payroll in a different period or for different workers, or you can use it for other, um, other expenses, like say for the rest of your rent payment or mortgage, that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, emergency economic, economic injury grant recipients and those who receive payment relief through this small business debt relief program can also apply for a PPP loan. Again, as long as there's no duplication in the use of funds. So at the bottom, it just says how to apply via a bank that is approved by the SPA 7A loan program. So this is actually sort of a, a big point and something that you're gonna wanna get squared away um, as soon as possible if your plan is to apply for this loan, uh, which is to figure out who your lender is going to be. So I think the first step would be to check with the bank where you already do your banking. And this can be, you know, if you're like an independent contractor, um, this can be just where you have your, your, the business account that you use, um, or maybe even, you know, potentially where you do your, your personal banking. Um, it, I think it really depends from lender to lender. So you're just gonna wanna check, you know, wherever you have a relationship, a banking relationship, you'll wanna check with them to see if they are doing the PPP loans um, if they're um, approved for, you know, SBA loans generally, and if so, if you meet whatever criteria they have. So we've heard that some banks only provide loans to existing customers, um, and there are reports that some banks have additional requir wor wor sorry, <laughs> requirements. For example, uh, Bank of America apparently was only providing loans to borrowers that have both a checking and a credit account with Bank of America, um, which some people, you know, they have their credit one place, they have their checking another place. And so that can be, apparently that, that's something that has come up in this process. So you're gonna wanna just, just check with your bank to see what kind of requirements they have in terms of who they're providing loans to. I found a really good compiled list um, on Forbes.com that I will pass around. And this lists all of the banks that are able to process loans that they've figured out so far are able to process loans for businesses that aren't already customers. And then also, this is new now, but in, in the first round of the PPP loans, they weren't allowing fintech organizations. So like, you know, startups that provide banking services, um, that sort of thing to, to administer these um, loans. But that is something that they have changed for the second time around. So there are a bunch of fintech organizations as well that can provide these loans. And those are also listed on that Forbes.com uh, list that I mentioned. And I'm gonna send that around after this presentation so that you guys all have that. And then I uh, just wanted to note that some of um, Fenwick clients applied at multiple banks since they didn't know which one would be the fastest to get the application processed. 
it really is. I mean, because everything is moving so quickly and nobody quite knows what's going on, it really is sort of like the Wild West. So just if you have the ability to do that, to sort of put feelers at a bunch of different places, I would really recommend that approach because you don't know which bank is going to be the most on top of it or bank or fintech um, organization is going to be the most on top of it. They all should be a little bit better prepared the second time around. Um, but still, you, you never know um, how quickly they're going to move. And the idea is that you want to get your application processed as quickly as possible since there's a limited amount of money av available. Um, we've heard that community banks have been actually particularly helpful. So maybe if you don't have a relationship already with a community bank um, in your area, it might be good to reach out to them and see if they can help you. Um, and then what you're gonna need to provide in order to apply is gonna vary from lender to lender. Um, so what we've heard is, um, you know, for example, like companies with employees, they'll need to do, provide a tax form 940 from 2019 if filed or uh, 2019 payroll processor records, including gross salaries and wages, similar to those produced uh, by acceptable payroll providers such as ADP, Paycom, SAP, Ceridian, um, Workday, et cetera. And then your 2020 tax form for, um, 941 or payroll processor records for the period between February 14th and February 29th, 2020. For sole proprietors or self-employed individuals without employees, you're going to want to um, have ready your um, 1040 Schedule C if you filed that in 2019 or your draft 1040 Schedule C for 2019 if not filed yet, and then um, uh, your income and expenses, your, your profit and loss statement. And then for independent contractors, you're gonna want your 1099 for 2019 for services rendered as an independent contractor. So just start getting those things together. Again, I don't know if that's exactly what will be required or if that's the whole universe of what will be required. Um, I think it's especially important for companies with employees to just have a very clear, to be able to you know, provide clear records of your payroll expenses for whatever period you end up choosing in order to apply for the loan. Um, and so it's just start trying to think about how you are gonna get those ready um, will be helpful. Um, and then just sort of as a general note, all the information you provide in your application, um, you're gonna have to certify that it's true and accurate. Um, and that knowingly making a false statement to get a loan under the program is punishable by law. Um, I don't think that should be an issue for any of you guys, but just something to keep in mind um, that you know, they are gonna take it seriously if there's any, um, any fraud that happens within the program. Okay, next slide. I won't talk so much about the other um, items. I think PPP is, is the best one because it provides the most amount of funding for you guys and it's forgivable. But there are also some other programs available from the Small Business Administration. Um, the main one being these economic injury disaster loans. So these also have been depleted, but I think I, I'd seen like, mm, I wanna say $10 billion. Um, I don't know that that is correct. I might just be making that up, but that was the amount that I'd seen as, as being potentially allocated in the second round of funding. Um, so this is, this is another thing that's available for you um, and worth discussing with your lender, especially when you go to apply for the PPP, if that's your plan. You can also discuss these loans because these loans are available to folks, even folks who get um, the PPP loans. Um, these are, again, not um, forgivable. So you will need to pay these back, but the, the terms are, are fairly favorable. I think originally these um, EIDL loans um, were put in place to provide um, loans to folks impacted by natural disasters, you know, so hurricanes, tornadoes, that sort of thing. But part of the CARES Act clarified that basically any business in the U.S., in the 50 states in the United States is eligible to apply for these loans right now because of COVID-19. So the principal amount that you can get is up to $2 million. The term is up to 30 years. The interest rate is 3.75% um, for small businesses. And collateral, collateral may be requested for loans over um, $25,000. So that's something to keep in mind. 
And then the use of proceeds is for expenses that you would have been able to pay if the disaster had not occurred. Um, so fixed debts, accounts payable, other bills, and payroll you know, to the extent that you're not already covering that um, with the PPP loan. The SBA generally takes about four to six weeks to process these disaster loans, but it will likely take longer at this time due to the substantial demand. And like I said before, this, this program is also depleted at this exact moment, but they're looking to um, allocate, I think about $10, mil $10 billion um, in additional funding to this program. So then repayment starts on the 12th month of the term. Uh, payments are deferred for the first 11 months. Uh, next slide. So to be eligible for this, um, for these loans, you need to have the following characteristics. So you'll need to have a physical presence in a state or territory where a declaration has been made. That's the general rule, but right now all 50 states are covered. So you just need to be in the United States. Um, the primary activity of the business must be eligible as well as the activity for which the loss is being claimed. Um, so generally a business activity is considered eligible unless it's um, one of the enumerated categories of ineligible businesses. So I think, you know, essentially if you're not a religious organization or a casino, um, stuff like that, um, you should be eligible. And then same as the PPP loan, generally it's less than 500 employees. You must be independently owned and operated and um, in operation on January 31st, 2020. And I would wonder again for the seasonal, because um, I didn't see as good of an FAQ or like a clarification statement about these EIDL, um, but you, you may want to speak with your lender if you're a seasonal operation as to whether, um, whether they'll look at a period other than January 31st. Um, so you'll need to be able to show that you're unable to meet your obligations and pay your ordinary necessary operating expenses as a result of COVID-19. So this can mean that you're engaged in services that are directly related to COVID-19 in some way, um, but it can also just be that you've suffered indirect harm um, related to the industry, which applies super broadly these days. Um, the SBA is going to take a look at your credit history and you'll need to demonstrate the ability to repay any loans that you incur. Um, as I said before, if the loan requested is for an amount over um, $25,000, $25, um, the applicant must pledge available collateral. Um, so that can include real estate. However, um, the SBA is not going to decline a loan for lack of collateral so long as they're reasonably sure that the loan can be repaid. And then loans over $200,000 may require a personal guarantee. All right, next slide. So these loans, to apply for these loans, actually, um, I misspoke before, because these ones you actually will apply to directly through the Small Business Administration, not through your banks. Um, there's a few other SBA loans um, that I'll talk about in a second that you can apply for through your, through your banks. But this one, you actually will apply directly through the SBA website. Um, your bank, your lender still might have information about it. Um, I, I'm not sure, but um, I'll do my best to answer questions at the end or you know, af after this presentation um, about these loans. So you'll wanna collect, um, you know, if you're independent contractor, your social security number, or if you're a business, the EIN number of the business, um, you'll wanna have this IRS form 4506T for the business principals and affiliates, and then this SBA form, which is the personal financial statement um, from the owners and then schedule out the liabilities of um, your business. And then to apply for the economic injury disaster loan, you wanna go to disasterloan.sba.gov, uh, create an account, you can apply online. There's step-by-step -step assistance at this, um, this, it's provided by New York, but um, I took a look at it and I think it will be helpful for you guys as well. Um, and just note that there are different questions for sole proprietorships that are addressed in a specific section of the guide. Um, and then you can contact the SBA for further assistance. Um, SBA Disaster Assistance Customer Service Center uh, can be reached at, at this number. I will also send this number out um, by email after this presentation so that you guys have it. Um, and just as a note, um, the website has been experiencing high traffic, of course. Um, so if you, if you go on the website during off-peak hours, that might be a, a better way to, to apply. And then there's more information at this link. Like I said, I'll, I'll pass all of these around. 
Uh, next slide. Okay, so then um, there's also grants that are available. If you're seeking um, one of these EIDL loans, um, you're also eligible for a grant that does not need to be repaid um, that you can get, I think within three, yeah, it says within three days um, of applying for it. So what you wanna do is you apply for that, um, the economic injury disaster loan, and then you can request this advance as well. And the proceeds of the grant can be used again for payroll costs if you're not already using the PPP loan to cover those. Um, for increased material costs as a result of um, supply chain interruptions, that sort of thing. Um, rent or mortgage payments or for repaying obligations that cannot be met just generally due to revenue losses. Um, and like I said before, this grant does not need to be repaid even if the loan application is subsequently denied. And you can apply for this grant in addition to a loan under the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, again, provided that they're not used for the same purpose. Next slide. Okay, so I know a little bit less about, I'll be perfectly honest about um, these express bridge loans. I think that these are ones that you can get. Yeah, you, so you, you, can, you can speak to your lender about this one as well. Um, if they're doing the PPP loans, they'll, they'll know something about the other SBA available loans. Um, uh, and if you have questions about this one, um, you know, I would take a look at the slide and then you can reach out and I can get more information about it. Um, but like I said, I'm not quite as, as familiar with these loans. I just know that they're available and wanted to, to, to present that to you guys. Um, next slide. Um, yeah, same, same with this one. Um, these, all of these loans, by the way, I think are just generally available um, from the SBA. They're not um, specific to COVID-19. And um, they're going to have that requirement that you've gone elsewhere to seek a loan before you can be eligible for this one. So just something to keep in mind. But it it's, is something that's available if, if you really do need the funding. Um, and like I said, the lender that you speak with about the PPP loan hopefully can help you with this as well. All right, uh, next slide. Okay. So then there's a few other things provided um, under the CARES Act help small businesses. So the first one is the Small Business Debt Relief Program. And so this actually just applies to um, folks that already have loans out with the SBA. Um, and so this would be 7A loans, 504 loans, and micro loans. Um, if any of you guys have those, just know that this is an option for you, that the SBA will pay all loan payments under these loans for six months. I think that this also will apply if, if you do take out new loans within six months of the president signing the bill into law, so that would be around the beginning of April, you can maybe take advantage of this as well. Um, I don't have a lot of information about it, but something to keep in mind and to ask about. The CARES Act also provides bankruptcy protection for small businesses. So what it did was it expanded the threshold for qualifying as a small business debtor under chapter 11 of the bankruptcy code. Uh, which can simplify reorganization procedures and reduce expenses. Um, hopefully this doesn't come up for you guys, but um, know that it's available as well. Um, if, you know, if, God forbid, you have to consider bankruptcy and you're not able to negotiate forbearance or forgiveness of outstanding debts of the business, um, you can take a look at, at this protection. And then there's also uh, student loan repayment, um, something to look into as well, which allows employees to repay student loans of employees on a tax-free basis, uh, but it's not deductible by businesses. Um, and this really should usually consider it if you're already repaying student loans of employees. Next slide. So then there's this employee retention tax credit. I had mentioned this earlier. Um, that this is the one that's incompatible for the payment protection program. So you have to pick one or the other, but this can provide a refundable payroll tax credit for 50% of wages paid to certain employees up to $10,000 per eligible employee through December 31st, 2020. Um, so who should consider it? Um, this would be small businesses whose operations have been fully or partially suspended due to COVID-19. Small businesses who have experienced greater than 50% reduction in quarterly receipts measured on a year over year basis. Um, but again, this is not available to businesses who are receiving assistance under the Paycheck Protection Program. And then there's also, um, you can delay payment of empl the employer portion of payroll taxes. So this just 
delays the, I'm sure you've already heard about this, but it delays the due date of the employer portion of 2020 payroll taxes. 50% um, is now due um, on December 31st, 2021, and 50% is due on um, December 31st, 2020, 20, uh, 22. So who should consider it? All businesses with employees other than businesses who are receiving assistance under the Payment Protection Program also doesn't apply there. And then there is um, the CARES Act also prize, uh, um, provides for increased flexibility of tax deductions. So for the 2020 tax year, it lifts restriction. Um, it lifts the restriction that net operating loss carryovers could be used to offset a maximum of 80% of a taxpayer's taxable income. So for 2019 and 2020 tax years, limitation on deductibility of interest expenses increased to 50% from 30%. And then uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020 losses may be carried back five years. I am not a tax attorney, so I don't, I'm not an expert on this. Um, I mean, if you have questions, I can, I can see if I can get them answered for you, but um, I'm not going to be the best source of information on this, but definitely something to speak to your accountant about to see if there's any, you know, any of these, um, of these changes to the tax code that were provided under the CARES Act can be helpful for your business. All right, next slide. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk just briefly about some California state programs. Um, again, not quite as robust as the federal programs, but potentially useful to you guys. So next slide. So the first one is this iBank uh, loan guarantee program. And so, it, you know, depending on your business, if, if you are having trouble, if you're unable to get the PPP loan, if you're having trouble getting loans from from other banks, um, what this does is provides a guarantee of up to 95% of the loan for up to seven years. So this you know, can help encourage lenders to provide a loan to you. Um, loan interest rates will vary, it depends on which lender you use, and then qualifications are based on lender criteria. And then just generally loan proceeds um, from these um, I banked back loans um, can be used for business to continue and sort of cure economic injury as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, next slide. And so this is um, just, this, these are the requirements for these um, loan guarantees from the California iBank um, that you must be located within California, that you must employ between one to 750 employees across all locations, and that you can show that you've been negatively impacted or experiences, experienced disruption as a result of COVID-19. Next slide. Um, and then there's a list here at this website that, again, like I said, I'll send out all of these links to you guys. Um, there aren't really that many banks that have signed up yet, but I think that they're updating it on a daily basis. So um, just something to, to have available um, in case you need it. Okay, next slide. All right, and so now I'm just gonna talk about a few other private programs um, that we've found. And this is just gonna be a sampling of, of what's available. I know stuff is changing on a daily basis. Um, and I also found another Forbes list, of, like a, a compilation web page that I think they're updating regularly that has some good resources in terms of um, these, these privately available um, funding sources. So I will pass that around as well. And like I said, that's being updated regularly. And so stuff is continuing to be added to this, this sort of category of available relief. Um, and so something that you can definitely keep monitoring on your own. Um, next slide. Yeah, so this is sort of what I just said, but the, the, the landscape is evolving. Um, please monitor it, consider uh, private loan providers, other private companies that might pr be providing loans or grants crowdfunding uh, platforms are always available, and then um, your local chamber of commerce. Next slide. So this is just um, a sample of some loans that are available. So there's the Fund Rocket Stimulus 2020 loan, which provides no interest loans of up to $1,000 to qualifying small businesses. There's more information at stimulus2020.com. They're currently accepting applications. Um, Kiva is also accepting applications for uh, no interest loans of up to $15,000 um, with expanded eligibility and grace period of up to six months. More information is available at kiva.org. Um, GoFundMe, um, they, 
their their project is that if if a small business is able to raise five hundred dollars on their GoFundMe and meets eligibility criteria listed just below and pulled that off the website um, listed on the website that you can be considered to receive a five hundred dollar matching grant from the Small Business Relief Fund um, launched by GoFundMe. Next slide. Facebook is providing um, some small business grants. This is potentially super helpful for you guys because they are grants and not loans. So definitely check this out. Um, I, I'm not sure exactly what the eligibility requirements are, but you can find information um, at facebook.com at, at this address, which I'll pass around. And then you can sign up for, for updates. I think actually a lot of these um, programs you can sign up for like newsletters for updates. So maybe a good idea to just like check out these websites, um, sign up so that you can keep getting getting updates about funds becoming available. Um, so there's this one which was on um, the slide that um, from Cleary, which I took a look at. Looks like they're not currently accepting applications. Um, this is specifically for um, the restaurant industry. But ag again, if you um, if they have some sort of newsletter that you can sign up for, it would be a good idea because they might um, accept applications in the future, not sure. Um, and then the restaurant community workers uh, can provide a no interest loan to restaurants impacted by COVID-19. This has just been announced. Um, I don't think that they're currently accepting applications, but um, I would monitor this one. Okay, next slide. So this one, th these next slides just provide a little bit more information about the um, Fund Rocket Stimulus 2020 loan. Um, so I'll go through them quickly. It's not a huge loan. Sandra's asking me to wrap up. Um, so yeah, I'll go through this one super quickly. Just that the, the loan is available for up to $1,000, interest rate $0, um, repayment schedule is variable, begins potentially two weeks after disbursement. And the timing of disburse, disbursement is typically one week after the application is submitted. Uh, next slide. So here's some information about eligibility. Um, next slide. And then repayment. Um, so the repayment amount, it looks like it's $100 per week. So I, this, this may be helpful for you guys, um, something to look into. Uh, next slide. More information here. Uh, next slide. OK. Uh, so like I said, we can, we'll pass around um, this, this list of links after the presentation. Um, but as the slide says, um, there's, inf there's new information daily. Um, so it's important to just like really keep monitoring the situation. Um, Start Small Think Big is continuing to monitor the situation and so is the city of San Jose. Um, but these are some um, good sources. I pr particularly wanna highlight and I'll send out a link to this one. Um, this San Jose specific one, um, it's super useful for you guys. All right, and I think that that's it for my piece of the presentation. Thanks, Elena. Um, Sandra, I'm not sure if you want to go ahead and help us with the questions, um, and we can go ahead and have Elena uh, do the rest of the questions for whatever she can field. I think it's a good moment to do that right now. Great. I am going to share my screen. Elena, if you can stop sharing your screen, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, um, Gray and Elena. We will now take this opportunity to address topic pertinent questions. Please be sure to add your questions to the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Once again, we encourage you to send all other COVID-19 pertinent questions to COVID-19SJBusiness at sanjoseca.gov. I will begin with our first question listed in the Q&A portal. Question number one reads as, how would I partner with a business that needs a laser cutter temporarily to cut masks, face shields, et cetera? 
I have an unused laser cutter I bought on a CIIF grant. I need to install it and use it to fulfill the grant or default and repay 6,000. Gray and Elena, can you address this question? I don't think that I can um, at the moment. Uh, Gray, do you have any thoughts? Uh, no, so this is what I would say. If there are specific, um, and, so I, and again, Elena, I think if there are any, oh, I know you're an attorney, so you do a lot of, um, there may be other work or other questions that people may have that are not related specifically to the topics that you covered today, and maybe that there's something there you can field. And, and as it relates to specific questions, um, what well, we are not able to provide the answer currently, um, there's a couple of things that we can do. Go ahead and just submit that. We can take a look and see if we can get you an answer. Um, at Start Small, Think Big, we can connect you with attorneys who work on a wide array of topics. Um, so we can also see if you're eligible for our services and we can connect you directly to somebody that can answer. Uh, and then, as I said before, COVID-19, given the current situation, we have rapid response assistance, both in finance and um, in uh, law, to make sure that you get support. So that's one way that I can address that. Um, as of right now, I, I don't have the answer to that question. Yeah, thank you, Grace. So I would like to encourage um, the, um, the party that submitted this question to please email our general inbox, and we will do our very best to address um, your inquiry. Thank you. The next question, number two, reads, and may be applicable to the information that Elena provided. Hello, I am a new owner of a beauty salon. All my stylists are independent stylists, so I don't pay them hourly. Wondering where I can get mainly to pay my rent space for the salon. Thank you. Elena or Gray? Yeah, so I would definitely look, um, definitely speak with your current uh, bank about what SBA options may be available. Um, it sounds like um, since you don't technically have full-time employees, I don't know if PPP would be um, the, the best option, although, although maybe uh, something to still look into. And there's some of those other loans that are available. Um, so I would, I would speak with them about that. Great, thank you. Question number three, we have started a restaurant on February 25th and it's impacted. The expenses are more than 40K per month and when we try applying for PPP, they are asking for 940-941 of 2019, which we do not have. When applied, it was not processed. What can be done to get PP loan? Got it. So I think, um, yeah, so the requirement, the SBA requirement is that businesses must have been operational on or before February 15th, 2020. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure exactly um, how you show, like sort of what the qualifications are for showing, you know, whether you've been operational or not. You, you said that you started on February 25th. But maybe if, if there were steps that you took before that, maybe you could make the argument that you were operational prior to February 25th, um, something to talk with your lender about. Um, so like I said before, I would go to your, your regular uh, bank and you know, see if they're a PPP lender, let them know that you know, you, your restaurant may be open on the 25th, but maybe you had other operations that were going on before then, um, and see if that there's a way that you can make the case that you were operational. Um, on or before February 15th, because I think that that is going to be sort of the first challenge here. Um, and then they're asking for the 940 or 941. Um, yeah, again, um, I, I think it, it is, the requirements are going to be lender specific. So maybe in that case, it might be worth talking to a few other lenders. And like I said, I would, I'm going to send out, you know, that, that list of, of banks that are taking, um, that are offering PPP loans to folks that don't currently have banking relationships with them. So maybe there might be somebody that you can work with who doesn't have the exact same requirements um, th that won't need to see those specific forms. Um, but uh, yeah, again, um, yeah, because I, I think that they should be able to take a look at if, if there's a draft of one of those forms for 2020. I think that that should work as well. Um, but like I said, I think it does vary from lender to lender. And if I can just share for people who have questions where you need support, so maybe it's a little bit hard or it's overwhelming to look through all of this information and you're unable to just 
uh, do it on your own. Again, I, I will refer you to the information related to the COVID-19 form for us. Right now, we have attorneys standing by. Um, again, we're activating law firms across the country that are actually working um, to rapidly respond to both uh, the legal and grant assistance, as well as any legal uh, questions in nature that may come up as you're having a conversation. So if you need consultations or anything of the, of the like, you should definitely uh, uh, go to our form and, and fill it out and, and, and we can go from there. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Gray, for emphasizing the services provided by your, uh, by your organization. Um, next question um, reads, I've already laid off my employees and we are still under shelter in place order. How can I spend all of the PPP money to get the loan forgiven? So as I mentioned before, um, as long as you can put folks back on the payroll um, before June 30th, you are still eligible for that loan forgiveness from PPP. Um, so I, I think the fact that you've had to lay off employees um, doesn't actually mean that you're not eligible for it. It just means that you're going to need to think about you know, how, how quickly you can onboard folks back again. Um, and then you can also you know, note that you can use up to 25% of your PPP loan um, for other things like well, mortgage, rent, and utilities. So um, I think it's definitely still worth looking into. Um, and like I said, your, your lender should have more information about um, sort of timing for that. Great, thank you, Elena. The next question, I, hi, I just received my funding for, from PPP, but there's a lot of information on loan forgiveness. When is more guidance expected? I want to best strategize use of, use of funds for loan forgiveness, so my plan is to increase my existing workers' pay rate by a certain percentage, pay some benefits to those employees that are home and are afraid to work, and also pay my people bonus checks. I know the intent of the funds is to pay my workers, but since there's not much guidance on forgiveness, I don't want to be in a position where I am using funds for what I think is the intent of the funds. For example, hazard pay and bonus pay. But then have guidelines come out where my use of the funds to pay my people don't qualify and then I'm slapped with a debt that will be paid back. Got it. So I, th I think for this one, um, first thing it's important to know that you can use 25% of the PPP loan to pay for mortgage rent or utilities. So that's one way that, you know, if, if you end up being eligible for more than um, your payroll costs are for that eight uh, week period, then you can use it for other things as well. Um, I don't know that you would need to increase pay rate, um, especially because the amount of the loan is going to be based on sort of the, the existing pay rate for your workers. Um, so I think you know, the main thing in terms of forgiveness that you have to keep in mind is the number of full-time employees that you have. So just making sure that the number doesn't get reduced. Um, and then also making sure that it looks like this, you're, you're not too worried about this one, but that you don't reduce salaries by more than uh, 25%. So those are sort of the big ones in terms of getting that, um, those, those two things. So not reducing the number of full-time employees relative to, to what you had before, uh, not decreasing salaries by more than 25%. And um, the third one being that you can only use 25% of the PPP funds for something other than payroll. Thank you. I just started my business last June. I have not filed tax return. How do I apply for a PPP loan? So I don't think that this should be an issue for you. Um, uh, so I don't think that this should be an issue. Um, I would go speak with your lender. Um, obviously, um, the deadline for filing tax returns has been pushed back. Um, and so it, I, I can't really see that, th that you're not the only, only one who's in this position. And I don't think that it will be, um, a barrier to you. Um, if your lender is saying that you need to have filed your taxes, um, I don't think that's correct. And you can maybe see if you can reach out to some other lenders to see if, if they feel differently. Um, Cause I don't think that's the intention that they would be limiting funds to only folks who've already paid their tax returns. Okay, thank you. If you're self-employed or a sole proprietorship, 
with only myself employed, how do I show that I'm absolutely just paying payroll? I don't want to get the money and then not get it forgiven because it's not clear that I'm paying myself payroll. Yeah, this is a good question. And I'm not quite as familiar um, with the rules for sole proprietorships, but you are eligible to receive PPP funds. Um, your lender might have suggestions about how to keep it clear that you're using your money just for payroll. Um, and, and you know, it, it helps if you've already been paying yourself a clear payroll in the past. Um, I don't know how you already have your sole proprietorship structured, but um, if you already have a system for paying yourself payroll, then I think you would just use those funds to pay uh, in that way. Um, but again, something that I think maybe your lender can help with, because um, I, I think you're, you're definitely on the right track in thinking about um, documentation for this, because it is important. But um, maybe, maybe the rules are a little bit um, less stringent when it comes to sole proprietorships. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I, I would speak with your lender because um, this is a good question. And if you if you want to follow up as well, um, I can see what I can find out on my end. Great, thanks, Elena. Do we know the time frame for when the PPP will be forgiven? Quite, quite yet. Yeah, so you'll know um, essentially within eight weeks of receiving the PPP loan whether 100% of your loan is eligible to be forgiven. And then, as I said before, that there's a six month deferral on, um, on uh, loan payments once you've received your loan. So you aren't going to be required to, to pay anything on your loan for at least six months. Um, and yeah, I think by then, you know, it's, it's a good, I don't think that there's a lot of guidance in terms of exactly how the calculation is going to happen and how um, it's going to be documented. Um, I, I, it's a good question. And I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, but again, I think you can do the calculations for yourself um, to figure out, you know, if, if you're going to be eligible for total loan forgiveness or only some percentage thereof, and then you can sort of budget that way. Thank you. Next question, does PPP loan forgiveness only consider full-time employees? I have several part-time employees and their wages were calculated in the PPP loan amount. Yeah, so it only considers full-time employees. I think in terms, I don't actually know. So in terms of figuring out the, the PPP loan amount, you're saying that you included part-time employees in figuring out the amount that you were eligible for. Um, so I think what I would say here, and I will look into this, um, and hopefully have a better answer, um, available offline. Um, but the, the full-time employee number is important for that forgiveness amount. So you don't uh, need to worry about full-time or part-time employees when you're thinking about, you know, whether you're going to be eligible for total forgiveness or not. And then um, if you have several part-time employees and their wages were calculated in the PPP loan amount, um, you can keep, the PPP loan can absolutely be used to, to pay those folks. Um, anything payroll related uh, can come out of the PPP loan. Great, thank you. Are landlords of a small business, small strip mall example, eligible for PPP and or idle relief? In this case, the landlords are two people and not receiving rent payments from several tenants due to COVID-19 impacting the landlord's finance, financial situation. This is a good question. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but I would think that you should be eligible for EIDL relief um, for sure. Um, since, you know, this clearly this is a result of the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, so I would maybe poke around on the SBA website. Um, and you can also call um, their helpline to see if, if they can help you address that question. And then again, maybe speak with your, with your current lender to see, um, to see where the SBA might be able to help. Great. If I can interject quickly, I also was just pointing out to folks on the chat, there are other service providers that are doing really great work in San Jose, 
Um, that includes the Silicon Valley SBDC. I put their information as well as the New America and Silicon Valley score. So if folks are again needing more information, there are very, very many direct service providers right now on the front lines. And so if you do need more information as it relates to how to get this moving, just feel free to reach out either to me and I can point you in the right, right direction or to the, to the partners here on, on the chat. Wonderful, thank you so much, Gray. Do I qualify to apply for the small business disaster loan even without file, filing my 2019 tax return? I think I already addressed yes. this one. Yeah, I think you should be Great. eligible. Great. Yeah. For IDLE, um, where do I check on the application status? I applied in the end of March. One second here. There was a little end of March, and I still have not received the $10,000 grant. Yes, yeah, so I think um, the, the timeline is supposed to be about four to six weeks. So I don't think that that's unusual and things are backed up because of high demand. Um, I don't know where you can check on the application status, um, but that is something that I can look into. Thank you. The next question, can you expand, one second, there's, can, thank you. Sorry about that. Can you expand to more on the state level employer retention grant? Uh, so I, I think that maybe that might have been a holdover from the New York based slides. Um, I don't think that there is one available for California residents at the moment. Um, yeah, that's what I have to say about that. Okay, thank you. The next question I received 10K advance idle. Can I use that for cost of good of goods sold or credit card operating expenses incurred? And confirming that this is a grant I don't have to repay. Yeah, so I, I think so. I mean, it, the grant is post. So if yes, if it's an advance for the economic injury disaster loan, then yes, it's a grant. Um, so you won't need to repay it, um, even if you don't ultimately get the economic injury disaster loan. Um, and I think, I mean, I think it is, can be used for pretty much anything that you're having trouble paying as a result of the COVID-19. Um, that's a good question, though. I'm going to write that one down as well. Great. Next question. I started the application at startsmallthinkbig.org and ran into questions I don't know how to answer, but must be completed to advance the application. Is there a way to talk to someone about the application questions? Yes, there is. Um, and I'm gonna, in a minute, send you uh, information related to me. That's a really easy one to fix. I'm happy to get on the phone or just email. So I'm happy to figure that out. Um, and this is great. So I'm just gonna go ahead and that, write that information down. Great, thank you so much, Gray. Um, how does PPP interact, if at all, with unemployment benefits in the case of the sole proprietorship I see? So my guess here is that if you apply and receive a PPP loan, that you can't also receive unemployment benefits. Okay, thank you. Next question, is idle one per owner or, or one per business? Can we apply once for each business? I don't have the answer to this one off the top. Um, my guess would be that you can apply once for each business, um, but I'll need to follow up on that one. Okay, um, an additional question on PPP. For PPP, is it full-time employee equivalents? So two part-timers could theoretically be added up to one full-time headcount? Please expand. It's another good question. I'll have to get back to you. Okay, thank you. Is idle one per owner or one per business? This appears to be the, uh, a similar question, so we will pass and yeah. we encourage folks to uh, to provide us with an email that is listed in the presentation. 
we are going to, that completes our Q&A session at this very moment. Um, and I would like to reiterate that if you have any additional questions, please do not hesitate in submitting those to our email address. And moving forward, we would like to share with you these resources listed here. Webinars and speaker series, including today's um, and future sessions are available at this shortened URL, this bit.ly um, URL. If you have any questions related to topic ideas and getting involved in future webinars, please contact Mirza Hanzar at mirza.hanzar at sanjoseca.gov to share topic ideas. In the event your business is laying off or downsizing, we'd like to provide you with contact information for workers adjustment and retraining notification, also known as WARN Business Service. Team at work to future at sanjoseca.gov. We'd also like to encourage all employers, businesses, nonprofits, and workers impacted by COVID-19 to write us at COVID-19SJBusiness at sanjoseca.gov or call 1-877-880-1222. And also note that translation services are available for Spanish and Vietnamese. Our upcoming webinar is scheduled for next Thursday, April 30th, beginning at 3 o'clock p.m. until 4.30. Our speaker agency joining us is Opportunity Fund, Kiva and Lisk Bay Area. We will be focusing our web webinar on non-traditional sources of funding for businesses affected by COVID-19 pandemic. This particular webinar will um, address um, results of COVID-19 and address any customer needs and concerns that have shifted in your organization. This will allow you to keep you focused. We will also be sharing relevant information for small businesses to help navigate through funding and other challenges, challenges stemming from this pandemic. For registration, please contact the email below, um, which is a direct email address for Mirza Hansar. Once again, at mirza.hanzar at sanjoseca.gov to sign up today. Once again, we thank you for joining our webinar and we look forward to, to next week's session. Thank you for your time and have a nice afternoon.